and welcome to the National Museum of African American History and Culture Digital Docents Roundtable and the exhibit entitled Reckoning, Protest, Defiance, Resilience. Let me introduce you to your four docents. I'm Sharon. I will start with a discussion of the photographs that are a call to action and catalysts for change in the protest gallery. Cheryl will follow me with a discussion of Black women who have fought to be heard and recognized in the women's gallery. Barbara will follow Cheryl with a discussion of the ugliness of racial confrontation and how Breonna Taylor's tragic death has inspired thousands to stand up for justice deferred in the Breonna Taylor Gallery. Denise will wrap up asserting that African-American artists are not just witnesses to racial violence in the United States. They have created artworks that give voice to the voiceless and reveal the ever-present threats to Black life in the Violence Gallery. This visual arts gallery exhibit dramatically demonstrates activism, commentary, and escape protest in the face of exclusion, defiance in the face of brutality, resilience in the face of conflict and death. This exhibition contains artwork related to racial violence and trauma, including race recent events. And now I'd like to introduce you to our director, Kevin Young. Welcome to Reckoning, Protest, Defiance, Resilience. This is our latest show here in the Rhymes Family Gallery on our fourth floor. Let's take a look around. So we picked this title, Reckoning, because we were thinking about the reckonings of the past few years, especially last summer with the protests around the murder of George Floyd. These were the largest protests and mass movement in American history. How do we capture that? This is something that African-American artists have long thought about, these questions of resilience, these questions of protest, and these questions of defiance that they bring together in visual art, whether it's photography, textile art, sculpture, or portraiture. And we're gonna see that here today. Thank you, Kevin. Where are you standing? Stand with me, please, at the entrance to the protest gallery. If you were in the museum, you would see these two large wall murals on your left and right, extending the length of this opening gallery. On your right is a Freddie Gray protest march, and on your left is a Black Lives Matter protest. I converge the two walls so you can easily appreciate the size, scope, and drama both photos of both photos while I introduce the first gallery. The intention in this gallery is to seize your interest and emotional engagement by providing ways to contextualize the momentous and paradigm-shifting social justice events of 2020 and 2021 through eyewitness accounts, the photographer's lens. All the photographers are physically present in their work. They have an insider's viewpoint. They are activists, advocates, and commentators on social justice. Their photos are so compelling because they are real, not someone's opinion or interpretation. They are generous. They want you to share the experience as well as admire an artful photograph. The photos are of Black Lives Matter movement and other national social protest demonstrations. Some predate 2020, but all are part of the reckoning. The deaths of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and other black men and women at the hands of police and captured and broadcast in real time on Instagram and other global media outlets intensified the growing national impatience with systemic racism and social inequity and demands for reform and accountability. The history, back, the history dates back to 1619. The struggle continues. The marcher's demands are written on signs and t-shirts, shouted from trucks, painted on flags. It is time that those responsible are held to account. Do you lean in or 
stand back. I want you to say it loud. Say it proud. George Floyd. I can't breathe. Tommy Oliver, a producer, director, and cinematographer, was editing his movie, 40 Years a Prisoner, when he heard the commotion. He grabbed his still camera, ran out into the street, and started taking pictures. As an example of rapid collecting, our museum now owns over 80 of his photographs. Rapid collecting is an action strategy. It is how museums today react quickly to social moments. Aaron Bryant, the curator of this gallery, said, the artifact, this case the photograph, actually stands as a metaphor. In many ways, it becomes a portal by which we can connect our visitors with the story we are trying to tell. Let's look at the photo. It's a wide and long view, thousands of people in the street, the largest protest in LA history. The curator's brilliance in making the photo wall size draws you into the street. Cedric the Entertainer and Michael B. Jordan add media star power to the expansive power of communities to confront injustice. Look at how the photographer draws you in. You find yourself standing with him on the back of the truck leading the protest. How would you feel if you were there? I felt the trauma in the women's voices. When they spoke, it was very emotional, fierce, and sobering. Sheila Prebright, who calls herself a photographic artist, is known for her activism photography, where she centers on women and celebrates the central role that women have historically played in organizing protests and leading demands for social change. Hashtag 1960 Now is a portfolio of photographs that documents Black Lives Matter as a movement of diverse ideas, communities, and cultures. It is a photographic series of emerging young leaders affiliated with the BLM movement. In it, Bright examines race, gender, and generational divides that raise awareness of millennial perspectives on civil and human rights. Let's look at the two photos of two different marches on two different days. Alexia Christian was fatally shot by an Atlanta police officer on April 30th, 2015. Breonna Taylor was fatally shot by a Louisville, Kentucky police officer on March 13th, 2020. You can see the anguish in Janelle Monet's face. And you'll also notice that the woman holding the Breonna sign is wearing a Trayvon Martin sweatshirt, thus linking these two events in our historical memory across eight years. This march in Baltimore took place two days before Freddie Gray's funeral. Jermaine Gibbs calls himself a photojournalist. He says that his greatest passion is street photography, and he has traveled the globe capturing ordinary folks carrying out their everyday ordinary activities. Gibbs says that photography has always been an escape for me, and I want my audience to be able to see beyond the image and see themselves in the story. Let's look at this image. Gibbs is standing off to the side of the line of marchers with linked arms. Their backs are to the line of police officers. Do you see yourself in the story? What is the story? What's really happening is that the line of protesters is in effect forming a peaceful buffer a zone between police officers and the angry mob outside the frame of the photo. Let me introduce you to the concept of visual literacy, which is defined as the ability to find meaning in imagery. It involves a set of skills ranging from simple identification, naming what one sees, to complex interpretation on contextual, metaphoric, and philosophical levels. Thinking about the images you have seen and will see, you can decide for yourself how visually 
literate you are. When we change the way we see, everything we see will change. Jermaine Gibbs. These are the only two non-photographs in the gallery. Many artists have used the American flag as a symbol or a formal challenge, as patriotism or protest. Let's look at the tiny one first. Jean-Michel Basquiat was an Afro-Latino artist of Puerto Rican and Haitian descent. During his 27 years on this earth, he experimented with unconventional materials and ideas. Beginning his career as a graffiti artist in New York, his works are found in galleries and private collections around the world. He was 17 years old when he interpreted this flag. He uses watercolor, gouache, and ink on composition book paper. The black X's were typed. It's about the size of a three by five card and was crumpled up and then partially smoothed out. The curators comment that the letter X in the blue field may refer to the X formerly enslaved people used when they could not write or to the X black Muslims use to reject their so-called slave names. But above all, by employing the X, Basquiat invokes the freedom of expression found in the paradox of liberty. Now let's look at Patrick Campbell's A New Age of Slavery. Patrick Campbell describes himself as an illustrator. He couldn't believe what was happening. Eric Garland's police officer murderer not indicted. Michael Brown's police officer murderer not charged. No one held to account. Campbell wrote in 2014, this was a piece originally done because I was sick of African-American death that has been occurring too much with Trayvon Martin, Mike Brown, Eric Garner, and many more due to the government not caring. As African-Americans, what are, is our life work? As a people, we should not be afraid of our government. Looking at this watercolor on paper, you see seven red stripes with bodies hanging from nooses and six white stripes, 13 in all. You also see 30 cracked stars, 10 profiles of killers with guns, 10 victims, 50 people in all. Another interpretation of the American flag. Denise will further elaborate on this flag image in her discussion. Many shared Campbell's outrage captured in this flag. He posted it on Instagram and it went viral. Beyonce, Jay-Z, Rihanna, among millions of others reposted it. It became a symbol of mass protest against police brutality and injustice. Now let's put these images together. I show you on the left how tiny the Basquiat flag is, but how important it is to the concepts of this exhibit as it shows on the very opening panel of the exhibit. You have seen this photo of marchers before, but I'd like to call your attention to a detail. The t-shirt of the gentleman on the far left bears an image. The image that, he, that it bears is that of Patrick Campbell's flag, thus illustrating how art is captured in the ephemera of the movement. Families equal resilience. Let's look at these three images. Two are by Zun Li and one by Devin Allen. We recall that Freddie Gray and George Floyd were often memorialized as caring fathers. Think about how many mothers have tearfully pleaded for their children's lives to be spared or for their killers to be caught. Zun Li is an award-winning visual artist, physician, and educator. He was born in Germany and now spends his time between Canada and the US. In his late 30s, Li discovered that he was not the son of two Korean immigrants. Rather, his mother was Korean and his father, who he never met, was Black. Coming out of his own experience, Lee 
challenges cultural assumptions about black males as men, friends, and fathers. He says he investigates black everyday life and family spaces as sites of intimacy, belonging, and insurgent possibilities against cultural displacement and erasure. The first photo on the left is captioned, Billy Garcia and daughter Esmeralda sharing a tender moment at a gas station from his father figure portfolio, 2011 to 2015, a quiet affirmation of resilience. The second photo is part of Zun Li's Black Lives Matter series. It captures a nightly demonstration led by the Brown family making its way down Ferguson Avenue in Missouri on October 11th, 2014. The composition of the photo and the play of light upon Michael Brown's mother and her husband leaves no doubt that strength abides and the fight continues. The third photo by Devin Allen is also untitled, but carries the caption, don't forget our women are getting killed also. We are the protectors and women are the first teacher to the child, need I say more? The woman with her white hair and shirt stands out from the others who are equally engaged in the moment, but remain in the shadow. She is demanding to be heard. Her expression is so intense and her hand grasping for the microphone is so strong that you can almost hear her plea. Protest, defiance, resilience. Michael McCoy tells us that I like to think of myself as a storyteller. From the minute I picked up a camera, I was captivated. I love telling the story about relationships between individuals, capturing those special moments of joy and contentment. I capture the in-between moments that are the most candid and authentic. McCoy's other works include powerful emotional moments during the BLM protests and the protests surrounding Freddie Gray's murder. This photo absolutely captivated me. After all of the intense activity of the other photos, this final photo provides that in-between moment, a time to rest, to breathe, to reflect. It is the stillness of it, the quiet of it, the gaze of the two young people. I saw the same gaze in the history galleries, in the portraits of enslaved and free African Americans, staring straight ahead, looking us in the eye. Neither proud nor humble, just strong, just complex, just human. The couple reflects resilience in their relaxed pose and neutral expressions. Their t-shirts bearing the famous Devin Allen photo shout protest. This magazine cover is not part of our collection, but I include it so you can see it clearly. Devin Allen, a gifted and artistically courageous young man, was brought up in Baltimore and committed to the raw documentation of his city, quote, end quote. He says he didn't have a voice and that photography gave him that voice. He is inspired by Andy Warhol and Gordon Parks. The curators tell us that he made history as a prodigy who conquered social media as a democratizing medium. Like Jermaine Gibbs, Instagram is his global gallery. This photo entitled Baltimore Uprising was shot in the midst of a Freddie Gray protest in Baltimore on, on April 25th, 2015. Through his photos, rather than allowing publishers to shape and interpret history, Allen proves that he has the power of history and that power belongs to and in the community. This magazine cover was selected as one of the best in 2015. Now I would like to pause and ask you to, equip, to consider, what does reckoning mean to you? Taking action to catalyze change, challenging cultural assumptions, displacement and erasure. 
embracing the in-between moments of joy and contentment. So now we will glance back <clears throat> at this opening gallery from the end instead of the beginning. I close my section by recalling that women are featured in the majority of the photographs. Women have played important roles as organizers, protesters, and documenters in the realm of photography. Cheryl will now explore activist women as depicted in print, textile art, and oil. Thank you, Sharon. And hello, everyone. Continuing on the subject of reckoning, I am going to encourage you to see, feel, and hear the gallery themes of protest, defiance, and resilience as we view renderings of four gifted visual storytellers, artists whose portraits reveal a lot about our history, even our present, and highlight the role women have played in our centuries long freedom struggle. Our journey crosses four types of media, quilt, all on canvas, graphite pencil, and linoleum, print on paper. Aptly introduced by the image before you, a 14 inch sculpture by 20th century artist, Mita Fuller. Ethiopia is a symbolic image of emancipation. It is, in Fuller's words, an image of a group who had once made history and now, after a long sleep, was awaking, gradually unwinding the bandage of its mummied past and looking out on life again, expectant but unafraid, and with at least a graceful gesture. Ready? Harriet Tubman didn't take no stuff, wasn't scared of nothing either, didn't come into this world to be no slave, and didn't stay one either, and didn't stay one either. Tubman's long and legendary life embodies gallery themes of protests, defiance, and resilience. Born to enslaved parents and nearly killed at 13, she determined to be free, escaped enslavement, and returned again and again to lead family and friends to freedom. To quote, I was the conductor of the Underground Railroad for eight years. And I can say what most conductors can't say. I never ran my train off the track and I never lost a passenger. Tubman's many roles as underground railroad conductor, union spy, scout and nurse, entrepreneur and philanthropist cemented her reputation as a remarkable American patriot. Protests, defiance, resilience. Several years ago, the National Museum of African American History and Culture and the Library of Congress acquired a photo album belonging to Quaker abolitionist and Tubman friend, Emily Howland. As part of a joint ownership agreement, the album recently moved to the Library of Congress. In it is a three inch by two inch photograph of Tubman in the, 19, in the 1860s when she would have been in her 40s. Lisa Butler, a fiber artist known for her quilted portraits used the photo to create a rendering of Harriet Tubman. Butler's technique is to find a photo in an archive, make a sketch, and start thinking about what she can tell from this person, from the veins in the hands, the lines on the face, the hair, the dress, the eyes. 
In Butler's words, it was a privilege to capture something of Tubman from the photo. What did she capture? For my part, a picture of activism, defiance, and resilience. I go to prepare a place for you are words spoken by Tubman to family and friends shortly before her death. Let's take a closer look at this more than seven foot new acquisition. Like the image in the photograph, Tubman is properly seated in a chair and gazing directly at us. Butler's quilt, however, burst of brightly colored African-based fabrics and intricate symbols against a dark floral background, together telling us much about the lady within. Check out the face and hands. In Butler's rendering, both are shown in contrasting shades of blue and purple with rich reds, symbolizing her coolness, calmness, and strength, as well as her power and force. Yellow fabric with red birds compose the sleeves of the dress, denoting freedom. Along the hem of the skirt is an orange wave design to symbolize pain and turmoil, but with small seeds growing upwards, becoming strong flowers, symbolic of strong, resilient women. The dark background with purple sunflowers and blue dots, reminiscent of the night sky, signified Tubman's travels in the night and her tremendous faith. At bottom center is an orange lion, an embodiment of Tubman herself. As we say on the museum's second floor, explore more of how Butler reveals Tubman's complexity as a person while echoing gallery themes of protest, defiance, and resilience. Our next two multimedia artists Charles Austin and Lava Thomas give visual expression to the role thousands of under acknowledged black women played in the same fight that Harriet Tubman was in. The fight for black people to be free and to be treated equally under the law. Both artists illustrate unsung heroes of the Montgomery bus boycott. Charles Austin was a painter, sculptor, illustrator, muralist, teacher, and co-founder of the artist collective Spiral. He was deeply moved by the civil rights movement and created Walking and All on Canvas in 1958, two years after the successful end of the Montgomery bus boycott. The painting depicts a group of walking women composed of sturdy shapes outlined, outlined by vivid slabs of color. In the artist's own words, it was a very definite walk, no going back, no hesitation. Let's see what his use of color in abstract techniques tell us. Do you see the columns of contrasting light and shadow on the skirts of the ladies leading the line? Do you see purposeful movement? What about the faces of the walking women? Why do you think Austin blurred the details in many of them? Perhaps to represent the mostly unrecognized women who form the backbone of the Montgomery bus boycott. Certainly, by reimagining the daily drudgery of traveling by foot as a determined march, Austin elevates the mundane act of walking to something monumental, even heroic, echoing gallery themes of protest, defiance, and resilience. We came to see that 
in the long run, it is more honorable to walk in dignity than ride in humiliation. Lava Thomas <laughs> says she was a creative bookish kid who loved to draw and had a facility for it. She grew up in her grandmother's beauty salon, listening to a lot of stories and female wisdom, naturally rooting her art in biography. Thomas drew from a memoir by a boycott activist to create her mugshot portraits, women of the Montgomery bus boycott. She specifically used pencil to, as she said, use a tool that is accessible to everyone. Some object everyone has held as evidence of the power of ordinary things, the extraordinary power of activism by ordinary persons. The mugshot of Eureta F. Adair is one of the series. Mrs. Adair was a member of the executive board of the Montgomery Improvement Association and one of over 80 boycott leaders indicted for what city officials deemed conspiracy that interfered with lawful business. Like Butler's portrait of Harriet Tubman, Mrs. Adair is defiant, gazing directly at us through her cat's eye style glasses. She is a lady on a mission, defiant and resilient. Do you see parallels between 1956 and today? Similar injustices and humiliations? I would say the rise in racial hostility and the methodical erosion of civil rights laws and protections are among them. Our final stop is the artwork of Washington born and bred Elizabeth Catlett a major presence in American art, and in my opinion, a lady whose alertness to racial prejudice and discrimination was evident early on. A grandchild of formerly enslaved persons, Catlett heard stories of slavery growing up. She learned the realities of life for African-Americans firsthand living in Washington, DC, and again, when her scholarship to Carnegie Institute of Technology was rescinded on the basis of her race. But the heavens were on her side. Catlett studied at Howard University, learning from such luminaries as Elaine Law, James A. Porter, and Lois Melu Jones. Over her 70 plus year career, she created a body of socially conscious art to, in her words, render visible that which had not been the subject of art, to convey social messages rather than pure aesthetics, and to give voice to the enduring dignity, strength, and achievements of Black women. Art for me, she says, must develop from a necessity within my people. It must answer a question or wake somebody up or give a shove in the right direction, our liberation. Catholic completed The Negro Woman in 1947 while studying and working in Mexico City. The intimately scaled linoleum cuts chronicle the oppression, resistance, power, and survival of African-American women 12 are on display. Each image is gouged with sharp angular strokes and named in the first person, inviting us to both witness and identify with the subject. Catlett later titled the series, The Black Woman. Three slides in particular echo gallery themes. I have special reservations, protests. 
My right is a future of equality with other Americans. Defiance. I am the Black woman. Resilience. The women portrayed in this gallery section represent the spectrum from a well-known activist to those who quietly pushed for equity. In exposing and condemning the crimes of the past, reckoning is in the forefront of their minds. These women exhibited bravery in their protests, a fiercely determined spirit to defy and correct inequities, and a resilience in the face of each and every aggression. Protest, defiance, resilience. As Sharon did, I asked you to think, what does reckoning mean to you? The defiant settling of accounts of someone who didn't take no stuff, the resistance to past injustices and oppressions, the unwinding of the bandage of a mummied past. Barbara continues to unfold the gallery's reckoning theme, introducing us to the works of two artists, Merton Simpson and Amy Sherrill, and the life of Brianna Taylor, a young woman who suffered violence she had no opportunity to fight against. Barbara. Thank you, Cheryl. Art has the power to provoke, inspire, inform, and force us to think in new ways. I think if people can see it and frown upon it enough, it might make them think, am I really part of this? Then I should want to do something about it. Those are the words of Merton Simpson. He was a man of many talents. He was a musician, a preeminent dealer of African art, and he was an abstract expressionist artist. Merton Simpson grew up in the segregated South of the 40s and he contracted diphtheria as a child, which kept him hospitalized quite often. And out of this experience grew his love for drawing. Now there were very few opportunities for art instruction or exhibition for black artists during this time. So Simpson eventually headed to New York. He studied at NYU and became friends with Charles Austin and Romare Bearden. The 1960s was a troubling time of war and civil rights protest. And Merton Simpson, along with Charles Austin and Romare Bearden, started the Spiral Group, which was a New York-based collective of African-American artists. They came together to contemplate the shifting landscape of culture, politics, and art. This is Simpson's Confrontation 28AA and 28A. They are two paintings from a series of 22 that were centered around racial strife. After watching a standoff between Harlem residents and the police in the 1964, Simpson produced a series of abstract gestural paintings he called confrontations. This is a diptych, two panels coming together to create one singular piece of art. Let's take a closer look. And I'd like you to consider these questions. What do you think is going on in this piece? Simpson describes it as an intense encounter, two heads in confrontation. How does Simpson illustrate the intensity of the moment? How many people do you see? What do you think the red represents? Simpson says he saw a kind of love coming through. What part of the painting are you most drawn to? Remember when we began, I mentioned that Simpson challenged us to consider, consider what am I, am I really part of this? Then I should want to do something about it. The next work of, the next artist rather confronts the viewer in a very different way. This is Amy Sherald. 
and she is a masterful portraitist. She lived in Columbus, Georgia, Baltimore, Maryland, and she now resides in New Jersey. And all of these places have greatly influenced her artwork. This drawing is not in our museum. However, I love it because of its delicate quality and reminds me of the time when Cheryl's life, in, at the time in her life when her health was failing. She had a heart transplant at the age of 39. Cheryl graduated from Clark Atlanta, Spelman, and the Maryland Institute College of Art. And like Simpson, she grew up in the South. She says that she was often one of a few African-American children in her class, which made her conscious of race at a very early age. She once stated that Black life in the South was often reduced to a single narrative, which inspired her to create new narratives about African-American life. And she drew her inspiration from photographs of African-Americans that W.E.B. Du Bois presented at the Paris Exposition in 1900. This photograph and the next one is not in our collection. However, both images were used to counter racist propaganda and to say, this is who we really are. Du Bois, Frederick Douglass, who was one of the most photographed men of the 19th century, both used the camera as a tool to counteract black stereotypes. Du Bois, Douglas, and Cheryl all used the portrait to emphasize the humanity of black people. This is Grand Dame Queenie, and it's a life-size oil portrait. Amy Cheryl has always been interested in identity how it's constructed and performed. Her subjects are usually standing, facing forward, confronting the viewer directly with their gaze, undaunted, confident, gazing right back at the world. And her canvases are often magically real. The skin tones are grayscale. And you may recognize this famous portrait of Michelle Obama done in the same um, technique of grayscale. Now her subjects are usually chosen randomly and they're photographed. They are dressed slightly unusual in fantastical costumes that she sources from thrift stores. And there's often a dual meaning in her compositions. Look closely here. Notice the raised little finger, the hands holding ever so gently the cup and saucer the ruffled shirt below, below the prominent yellow bow and the striped pants. Is this figure male or female? Is Cheryl critiquing a social norm or challenging a dominant narrative? Or is she making a connection to a particular experience? For more than 20 years, Amy Cheryl has filled up the narrative with black families and black people on canvases. She challenges the status quo by saying, I am my own ideal. The portrait of Breonna Taylor by Amy Sherald. It's a transformative piece, which brings her to life, along with a timeline of Breonna Taylor's life written by her mother, Tamika Palmer. Breonna Taylor, was a 26-year-old young woman who did not get to live the life she had envisioned for herself. She was brutally murdered in her own home. When Amy Sherald was asked to paint the portrait of Breonna Taylor, she felt that she was giving her a voice. It was the first time she had ever painted someone who was no longer living. She did extensive research, studying many photographs of Brianna and even speaking to her mother, Tamika Palmer, who mentioned that her daughter loved to dress up. And that was something Cheryl wanted to convey in this portrait. Cheryl photographed a model who shared Brianna's similar body type and contacted a black designer in, in Atlanta for the dress design. She spent two weeks on the face alone, trying to get the perfect layering. She went through 14 different backgrounds, dress colors and hairstyles before settling in on turquoise, which was Brianna's birthstone. 
Cheryl chose to paint both the dress and the background in similar tones as a way of having the viewer to focus in on Brianna's face. She wanted the painting to feel ethereal and grounded at the same time. Notice the cross at Brianna's neck. This represents her faith. And the ring on her finger, this was a love story. Brianna was about to become engaged before she was murdered. And notice her hand on her hip. Taylor says, she sees you seeing her. The hand on her hip is not passive. Her gaze is not passive. She looks strong. Cheryl also says, I wanted this image to stand as a piece of inspiration to keep fighting for justice for her. Cheryl says, when you're speaking about violence against women and police brutality, she becomes a face for that movement. And finally, it will take resilience for this family, this community, and a people to stand up for justice deferred. And I also ask, what does reckoning mean to you? Does it mean, am I really part of this? Then I should want to do something about it. Does it mean I am my own ideal and I will challenge the dominant, dominant narrative? Or does it mean I will keep fighting for justice? Next, Denise will highlight works in the section of reckoning, the reckoning gallery, which deals with the difficult subject of violence. The history of racial violence in our nation is one of tragedy and resilience. Not just being witness to such violence, African-American artists have created artworks that give voice to the voiceless and reveal the ever-present threat to Black life. The continued chronicle of violence against women, their protest, defiance, and resilience in the face of such violence will be highlighted here. Please recall our admonition about the violent scenes in this section. Denise? Thank you, Barbara. Often, police officers make choices that help and protect our communities. Sometimes police officers make choices that are hurtful and unfair. When anyone, including police officers, treats people badly because of their skin color, that's a hurtful choice. No one deserves to be hurt or treated unfairly because of who they are. We can all make choices that are fair, kind, and helpful. Flower Memorial for Peachy at first glance is bright and happy, but it illustrates the tragic effects of police brutality for three individuals. Jordan Edwards, Joaquina Valencia, and Justine Damon. Edwards was only 15 years old when he was killed by a police officer in Balt Spring, Texas, while sitting unarmed in a car with four friends. The officer was sentenced to 15 years in prison. Valencia was wrestled to the ground in Riverside County, California, and arrested for selling flowers without a vendor's license. She sued, sued the county uh, sheriff's department, claiming she was unlawfully targeted because of her race. Damon, an Australian American, was shot and killed by a police officer after she called 911 to report the possible assault of a woman in an alley behind her house. The officer was found guilty of third degree murder and second degree manslaughter. Peachy folders go back to the 1940s as a place to store homework and assignments. Bright with a peachy color, the original illustrations were drawn by fishing and wildlife artist Francis Golden. Students apparently love to deface the drawings and create their own. One artist has began, begun to take these classic illustrations and has given them a new socio-political context. Artist Patrick Martinez has created several paintings in the PG folder style, documenting these instances of social violence in the US since 2015, mostly depicting, depicting uh, police brutality and death at the hands of police officers. 
Let's take a closer look at this image. What do we see? The police officer seems to be chasing a football player. Another police officer is drawing his weapon behind a group of runners. And to the far left, the police officer appears to be swinging a club at a recent graduate, still in his cap and gown. After the deaths of Eric Garner in New York and Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri, Martinez says he felt compelled to revive the PT concept. He said it was initially inspired when he realized that many American middle and high schools now have police patrolling hallways and classrooms. I had reference now, he explains. And as the news cycle continued to turn out stories of one tragic death after the other, Martinez continued to paint. There was always content, insecurity past, insecurity present, insecurity future. Colette Vici Coulors explores race, class, and gender identities through her work. In this triptych, insecurity past, insecurity present, and insecurity future are part of a larger series of works titled Metaphors and Life. Within these photographs, the female form is a metaphor that contains a range of human experiences and emotions, including pain, self-doubt, anxiety, and uncertainty, as well as resilience and courage. The triptych and the emotions the photographs explore and convey signify the emotional life experiences of yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Screaming often denotes violence, but sometimes silence denotes violence. Let's take a closer look at each of these images. In Insecurity Past, we see the female form withdrawn into a small space. We can barely see her knees under her head. Or what also appears to be a void or blank space. Her hands appear to be wringing in anguish or, dis or despair. What has she been through? Does her resilience lie solely in her ability to survive into the future? Insecurity present. Here the form is seated with her legs crossed, her head dipping below her curled shoulders. Most striking is the position of her hands, held out as if questioning why. Is she protesting her fate here? We only see the top of her head, or we see the void. What is she asking us? In Insecurity Future, the figure has raised her knees up to her chest and has drawn her entire body even closer. We see what appears to be a wedding band on her finger, but we are drawn to how the finger seemed to clutch at her hair or out into the void. Is it anguish? Is it despair? Is it defiance? What is the future telling us here? And what is she asking of us? Southern trees bear a strange fruit. What exactly is a lynching? Blood. It's a form of violence in which a mob, under the pretext of administering justice without a trial, executes a presumed offender, often after inflicting torture and corporal mutilization. mutilation. The term lynch law refers to a self-constituted court that imposes sentence on a person without due process of law. Mildred Thompson drew this image in 1963. The sexual and violent torment African American women have endured is very well expressed in this image. 
Thomas had serious problems remaining in the United States after hearing of several mentions, and she left for Europe not long after making this drawing. Whether they're wearing a hat and naked or a hood, there are few images in American art that more clearly depict racially motivated violence and sexual assault against Black women. This is a pen and ink drawing depicting a scene of abstracted male figures lynching a nude figure. She's female. The female figure is depicted in the center hanging by the neck from a noose attached to an unseen tree. Her hands behind her back is a way of say, suggesting that they are bound. Surrounding her is a mob of male figures, most of them in long robes with pointed hoods that obscure their faces. Others are nude, except for Western style hats with center badges of the type worn by sheriffs and other law enforcement of the period. Their facial expressions are somehow abstracted with bared teeth and leering expressions. All of the male figures wear Western style heel boots and they're all centered around the lynched woman. One hooded and robed figure raises a Christian cross over all their heads. What is that supposed to denote for the viewer? How does it make you feel? The American flag can mean a lot of different things to different people. Even though our country's important laws say that all people have a right to live, be free, be happy, not everyone gets those things, and that's not fair. The artist here is using this painting of the American flag to tell us that. Unmistakable in its flag imagery, the new age of slavery is a watercolor created by artist and illustrator Patrick Campbell that is currently on view in the gallery. Sherry mentioned this piece in her opening. Campbell initially shared the work on social media in September 2014, shortly after he painted it, but this haunting work didn't gain widespread attention immediately. But by the time Campbell reposted New Age of Slavery on his commercial uh, Facebook page in December of 2014, the image had gone viral. Subsequently, as Sharon said, the image has been widely used on a number of products. What do we see? Embedded within the red stripes are the unmistakable images of men and women being hanged. Let's take a closer look now at the star field. What do you make of the stars? They are broken misshapen as if to signify the broken state of race relations. What else do we see? A person seems to be shooting a gun at another person with his back turned. In another image, we see one person pointing a weapon toward another on his knees with his hands held out as if begging for mercy. This piece of rope up to the side of the image was used to bind Raymond Byrd's hands when he was lynched in Wyeth County, Virginia on August 15th, 1926. The rope in our collection is constructed from twisted twine and has been coiled into a circle. Both the ends of the rope are frayed but with single pieces of twine. The presence of such a rope for Black people signifies a fear rooted in history and the murder of more than 4,000 Black people in this country via lynching. Part of the 12 part series, The Black Woman by Elizabeth Catlett, discussed by my sister, Cheryl. Black and white line of cut here of a hanged man. Now, the center of the image shows a lynched man with a noose around his neck and open eyes. He gazes up at people. He is lying with his limbs bent and one arm above his head. Let's take a closer look. What do we see in this close up? The man, as I said, is lying down, looking up. His hand is raised. 
Is he waving or is he fending off someone? I see three pairs of shoes. What do they signify? How many people do you think have actually been lynched in this drawing? Are they standing on the rope or swinging above it? I see four. And I think of Catlett's title for this piece and a special fear for my loved ones maybe indicates that she fears for the four seen here. The greatest violence that you can inflict on a mother is to kill her child. Here marches Leslie McFadden Head, the mother of Michael Brown. The 18 year old lay on the ground for hours in the hot Ferguson sun. He would have turned 26 this year. Leslie's shirt reads, Innocent Blood. This is a digital image of protesters walking down Ferguson Avenue toward the Ferguson Police Department. She is holding hands with her husband and she is surrounded by a large crowd as she marches. But I am mostly drawn to her face, the face of determination, a protest, obviously, a defiance, certainly of resilience, most definitely. What must it take for her to take each step in honor of her son and all the other sons? The last gallery in the exhibit displays some diverse pieces that one might not immediately consider as part of reckoning, but they very much are. The subject of an offering by Stephen Towns was inspired by Marcus Redeker's 2007 book, The Slave Ship, A Human History. The series of seven panels late pay hot homage to West African people who were uprooted from their families and forced to endure the brutality of the Middle Passage and enslavement. The shape of each panel recalls the iconic 18th century British slave ship, the Brooks. The candles represent an offering to these ancestors in a gesture of gratitude and solace. When protest and defiance are met with pain and death, consider what resilience requires. We ask, what does reckoning mean to you in the context of each segment of our tour today? We use excerpts from the artist's quotes in the responses. So our responses are all correct. What does reckoning mean to you now? We invite you to join us in other docents for other virtual tours in our community and conversation program. Links to various topics are located on our events page on the museum website. And now we wanna thank you for joining us for reckoning, protest, defiance, resilience. We hope you will visit us at the Mu National Museum of African-American History and Culture very soon. <laughs>